All right, if we're going to talk about a space race, then we are going to have to talk about China. Because for all the money that guys like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos have, and they have a lot, China has more. The resources that the China National Space Administration command are both impressive and mysterious. See, while most other nations of the world have been taking a collaborative approach to space exploration, China has been off doing their own thing and going it alone. And that's not exactly their fault. The US basically told them that they're not allowed to sit with the cool kids at the space table. So today we're taking a look at what China has been up to with their space program, what they're working on right now, and where they are going in the future. This is the space race. The Chinese space program dates back farther than you might think. I know I was surprised to learn that China started developing aerospace technology in the late 1950s alongside the United States and Soviet Union. China was a kind of unsung contender in the original space race. Chairman Mao was not a man to take things lightly, no surprise there really. So when President Dwight Eisenhower threatened China with nuclear weapons in 1953, Mao responded by starting his own nuclear program. When he saw Russia fire their first Sputnik satellite into space in 1957, Mao decided to launch his own space program as well. It's widely believed that China didn't enter the space race initially for superiority or victory in the way that US and the Soviets did. China was in a kind of self-defense mechanism to make sure they weren't outgunned or left behind. The Chinese actually had some very decent success in the late 50s and early 1960s by essentially reverse engineering Soviet rockets and making their own copies. By 1964, China was able to launch a crew of mice into orbit. When the conquest of the moon became the hot topic in the late 1960s, Mao again decided that China should do it too. By 1969, China had developed a heavy lift satellite launch vehicle that they had derived from an intercontinental ballistic missile design. A few iterations of this rocket design led to the Long March 1, the first in a long line of Chinese satellite launch vehicles. The name Long March comes from the formative year of Mao Zedong's command over the Red Army. In order to escape annihilation by Chinese nationalists, Mao led his troops in a circling retreat that lasted 370 days and covered 9,000 kilometers of rugged mountain terrain. The first attempt to put a Chinese satellite into orbit on the Long March in 1969 was a failure, but the second launch on April 24, 1970 was successful at placing the Dongfang Hong satellite, also known as Mao 1, into orbit. At the time, this was the heaviest satellite to reach orbit. By 1971, the Chinese were making plans for a crewed mission to space with a target date of 1973. At the same time, the Republic was entering the height of the Cultural Revolution, a pretty infamous period of unrest where Mao fought to purge all remnants of capitalism and traditional society from Chinese society. It was a rough patch to say the least. The space program floundered for a few years through the early 70s with a couple of launch failures setting back progress. But in 1975, China had a successful satellite launch on the Long March 2. Everything seemed to be moving along pretty well until the death of Chairman Mao in 1976, which brought the whole operation to a relative halt. Also, if you're enjoying the video today and learning some cool things about space, then please take a moment of your time and click the thumbs up button for us. We're still a pretty small channel and trying to grow and for whatever reason, the thumbs up is what helps us to accomplish that. So thank you for your support. So all that was just a crazy story to set the stage for China's blistering return to the space race in the 21st century. After simmering on the back burner for decades, China reignited their space program by sending astronaut Yang Liwei into orbit in the year 2003. This made them only the third country to have achieved independent human spaceflight. Take a second and think about that. While every other nation was just hitching rides on NASA's space shuttle, China decided to do it on their own using the Long March 2 rocket and their Shenzhou 5 spacecraft. And that was just step one. By 2007, China had placed a satellite into orbit around the moon. 
By 2011, they launched a prototype space station into Earth's orbit called the Tiangong-1. In 2013, China landed their first rover on the moon, again making them only the third nation to achieve this aerospace milestone. Then in 2016, China launched another prototype space station, the Tiangong-2, and their astronauts lived in it successfully for 33 days. China's space program in the 21st century took off like a literal rocket, and pretty much no one really noticed, especially not the United States. George Bush was understandably distracted fighting a baffling war on two fronts, and then Barack Obama just didn't really care about space. Under Obama, the space shuttle program came to an end with nothing to succeed it, and America lost the ability to even reach space on their own. Obama famously said that he didn't care about going to the moon because America had already been there. Why bother going back? So we essentially got the aerospace equivalent of a tortoise and hare story. America just kicked back and did nothing, while China came up from behind and passed them by. Until President Trump comes along. I want to throw in a very quick disclaimer before we go any further that we are all Canadians here behind the scenes and have no horse in the race of the US government and don't particularly give a shit about political machinations in America. We have our own stuff to worry about up here. You all do you. Anyways, say what you will about Donald Trump. The man loved space. Not only did he launch the Space Force, which is actually just a rebranding of the Air Force Space Command that was established in 1982, but the Trump administration also acknowledged that there was a new space race underway. Not only between Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, Trump was famously quoted as saying, we've got these rich guys, they love rockets, but also on an international level. Then Vice President Mike Pence was famously quoted as saying, make no mistake about it, we are in a space race today, just as we were in the 1960s, and the stakes are even higher. He said this in 2019 at a meeting of the National Space Council. Just months prior to the meeting, China had landed yet another lunar rover, this time making them the first nation to explore the mysterious dark side of the moon. Pence continued by saying, quote, the United States must remain first in space in this century as in the last, not just to propel our economy and secure our nation, but above all, because the rules and values of space, like every great frontier, will be written by those who have the courage to get there first and the commitment to stay. And the US government had good reason to fear being overtaken in the final frontier. Just a year later, after Pence's speech in June 2020, China placed the final satellite in their Beidou network. This is a satellite navigation system that is newer and better than the global positioning system that was established by the United States. The civil version of Beidou has a claimed accuracy to 10 meters, about double the accuracy of GPS, and the restricted military service for the system is claimed to be accurate down to 10 centimeters. In 2020, the Chinese space agency launched 39 missions to deliver payloads into orbit, while the US launched 44. And China did this while spending about one-fifth as much money on space exploration as the United States. In 2021, China launched the core module of the Tiangong space station into orbit by a Long March 5 rocket. This is not another prototype. This is the first stage of a new permanent space station owned by the Chinese government. And that is a very big deal because China isn't allowed on the International Space Station. Remember off the top how we said the US basically pulled a you can't sit with us routine? In 2011, the United States government officially barred Chinese astronauts from visiting the ISS. Even though the word international is literally in the name and the station is a collaborative effort between the five space programs of America, Russia, Canada, Japan, and the European Union, meaning that the US really should not be the boss of the whole thing. In hindsight, that was probably not the best choice, as now, 10 years later, the ISS is rapidly aging and will need to be decommissioned within the next 10 years. So far, there is no concrete plan to replace it. So as the old guard is fading away, China is building up their shiny new station with a modular platform that can expand over time to be whatever they want it to be. 
The first phase of the Tiangong will only be about one quarter the size of the ISS, but it will be much more efficient in its use of space and power. The solar system of the Chinese station should prove to be a major improvement and will allow the station to use electric ion thrusters to hold its place in orbit. The current ISS burns about 9 tons annually of rocket fuel to maintain its own position. The Tiangong is even planned to have its very own telescope with a high-powered camera that will probably best the Hubble telescope for image resolution. So obviously, now the Chinese can turn to the Americans and say, well, you're not allowed on our space station. And that would be a big problem. Of course, then the US are going to build their even more advanced gateway station out in orbit around the moon and tell the Chinese that they're not allowed on that one either, and so on and so on. It's all just kind of disappointing. All I want for humanity is a Star Trek future. This is not how we get Starfleet. This kind of bickering is how we get some miserable, shitty future like the Expanse. Now, that's not to say a space race is a bad thing. The opposite, really. A good old space race is about the best thing that can happen for technological advancement. The Cold War days led to major investments in intellectual pursuits for both the US and USSR. The rise of aerospace industry, semiconductors, Silicon Valley, that all came out of the military-industrial complex of the 50s and 60s. In the mid-1960s, 4% of the US government budget was going into space exploration, and that got them all the way to the moon with computer technology that couldn't even handle playing back this YouTube video. Even with the recent uptick in NASA funding, they're still only getting about a quarter, maybe a bit more of those resources by comparison. So where do we go from here? Well, China is currently on a long-term exploration mission to Mars with their new rover that landed on the red planet just a couple of months ago. This makes China just the second country to drive a rover on Mars. Others have made attempts at it, but everyone aside from the US has failed to get their rover functioning until now. And if China did it once, then don't think for a second that they aren't planning to do it again. And who knows what they're going to send next. It's rumored that China has something in the works that is basically an equal to the SpaceX Starship Super Heavy vehicle. Call it just a Starship ripoff if you will, but the fact is, if it works, then that means China is landing a lot more than just remote control cars on the red planet. Then there is the moon. Who even knows what China's rover is doing over there on the dark side of the moon? But whatever it's up to is again, just step one in a bigger plan. NASA might think they're clever with the gateway station in orbit around the moon, but word on the street is that China and Russia are working together on a moon base. Yeah, building on the surface of the moon. And if we had to guess why they are doing that, it's probably in pursuit of this element called helium-3. It's rare on Earth, but seems to be abundant on the moon, and helium-3 has a really great potential for use as a nuclear fuel in fusion-based reactors. I'd imagine that has a lot to do with the reason that Mike Pence felt such a sense of urgency in getting competitive about space again. There's now something to lose in the space race, and being the first to get a foothold on the moon could be a solid first step towards becoming the new superpower on Earth. Of course, none of this would matter if we could just learn to get along, but I'm not holding out hope for that anytime soon. So let us know what you all think. Is China set to take over space? Do they end up beating NASA to the moon? Drop your theories in the comment section below. Also, please don't forget to give the video a thumbs up today. That really means a lot to us and we appreciate all of your support. We've got two more videos on the screen for you to check out. They're pretty awesome if I do say so myself. Subscribe to this channel for more videos and ring the notification bell also. It's a lot of work, I know, but it'll be worth it. Thanks for watching the video and I'll see you in the next one.